seems to be quite a bit of interest on the uh, Zeta uh, board. Um, quite a few people have been buying them off of eBay, so a lot of people are really interested in this for various reasons. I think uh, it's a real cheap way and, and clean way to get into the old retro computing, the old CPM days. Um, people are trying to replace their <laughs> childhood computers with something small and fun uh, instead of these big monstrosities like M size and Carmenko's and stuff. Anyway, um, mine is getting closer and closer to uh, being able to be put together. Um, uh, I had a notification from uh, Mauser that uh, uh, my packages are on their way. So I should be able to have chips in in about a week. Um, so I should be able to get um, get the board populated and up and running. So I thought it might be a good time to go take a look at the uh, schematic more in detail. I, I really haven't looked at it very closely. And there are some interesting things that I've learned uh, while building it. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this thing chip by chip. Um, certainly there is a Z80. It's not your it's not your dad's Z80. Uh, it's a pretty fast one. It's a, a, a 8 megahertz version. I, I think you can even boost these up to 10 megahertz if you buy a, a faster chip. But the board's kind of designed around 8 megahertz. Uh, so that's what mine is. Um, so here's an 8 megahertz uh, Z80 uh, CMOS, nice CMOS version, not NMOS or anything like that. Uh, so pretty modern, pretty modern equivalent. Um, and it is just a standard, standard uh, Z80. Uh, the next chip is the ROM. Um, it's a flash ROM. Uh, so that's pretty modern too. Um, and um, it is pretty large, uh, 512K. Um, so it needs bank switching. Um, the CPM and Z80 and stuff can only run 64K at a time. So you need to do bank switching. Um, and so uh, we'll show that a little bit later, but this board does have bank switching. So there is the um, uh, the ROM, and um, that will contain the CPM program and some other things. Um, I believe when it wakes up, it's in a kind of a monitor program, and then you tell it which one you want to boot. You can type C, and it goes to CPM, and that'll do bank switching and go to CPM, things like that. Then there's RAM. Um, again, uh, way too much RAM than you can use, uh, 512 again, but it's bank switch, so you can create uh, virtual um, uh, floppy drives. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And um, the RAM chip is actually battery backed up. So you can have this board configured such that when you turn the power off, you don't lose anything that's in RAM. So you could, could, treat, the, could treat these as um, non-volatile disk drives as long as your battery doesn't go dead. Uh, it should remember everything. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the next chip is the um, UART. Uh, pretty standard UART. Um, nothing strange going on here. Um, next chip is a Western Digital floppy controller. It's a pretty modern chip, too. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll, I mean, I ordered one. Okay, I ordered one. I'm going to hook it up, uh, try it out. Um, so I, I don't intend on using it, but it's on the board. Okay, I want to play with it. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll we'll try that out. Um, the thing that I probably won't play with is um, it does have a parallel port, and there's a companion card that allows you to do video output. I'm not interested in that. I'm going to run this thing as a uh, just it through a terminal. But this might be fun for other projects um, like a speech controller or something like that. So. Uh, it does have 24 pins of I.O. and it's an 8255, so that's all standard stuff. And the parallel port comes out on a connector. There is one uh, jumper on the board that's a bit confusing. And don't uh, don't get confused by the silk screen. The silk screen is very confusing. Um, but basically you put one jumper to ground pin 25 or you, you move the jumper over to put VCC on pin 25, depending on what you want to do. Um, and uh, the silk screen leads you to believe the jumper goes a certain place, but it doesn't. So take a look at the uh, schematic. Uh, pins 1 and 2 are jumpered for ground. Pins 2 and 3 are jumpered for VCC. 
and you can just turn the board over and figure it out for yourself. Just kind of trace the, figure out where the traces go. Uh, floppy interface is just on a header. Um, there is the timer chip, which I'm not quite sure all what it does, but there is a timer chip. Um, and associated with the timer chip is the divide by divide by two circuit. Uh, so this is just configured as a divide by two. It's a D flip flop with not Q going into D. That's a standard configuration. So they're bringing in um, UART clock and dividing it by two, and that generates the clock for the timer chip. And now the UART clock is 1.8432 megahertz, some multiple of baud rates. Um, but they do divide this by two before they give it to the timer, so that's interesting. Um, there's two little 8-pin chips. One is the real-time clock. Uh, that's this one here. And it has a little crystal, a uh, 32 uh, kilohertz crystal on it. And uh, it's battery backed up, of course, also. So it remembers the time when you turn off the power. The other little 8-pin device is um, the uh, voltage controller for the battery backed up RAM. Um, it automatically switches from normal power to battery power um, when the device isn't being uh, powered up. So that's just a, a, a voltage monitoring chip. Um, there's a little inverter here, uh, or it's a, it's a bus driver, um, and it allows some configuration bit to be read on D6. And uh, if you don't have the jumper installed, it's a one. And if you have the jumper installed, it's a zero. This just goes to a pull-up resistor. And that allows you to somehow configure the real-time clock. So I'm not quite sure what that is. That is. Um, I did load the, the header onto my PC board, and I have a little jumper, so I can install this or not install it. I'm not sure what it does yet, but uh, that's, that's how it's being used. It's just uh, either a zero or one. Uh, there's the battery backed up. Uh, uh, for the RAM and for the clock. Um, and then there is a bunch of logic for the addressing schemes. And that's always an issue with these old processors. They don't do addressing well, so you have to always decode them. Uh, so there's one set here that's decoding some address lines and some signals like memory fetch and IR uh, request and uh, stuff. And anyway, this is a three of eight decoder uh, so you only get to uh, look at one of these things at a time. So real-time clock, flip disk drive, you know, UART, things like that. So it just, it's just decoding for those chips. Some additional decoding for, um, again, the real-time clock and the uh, de-acknowledge, which I'm not quite sure what that is. Some type of handshaking for the read. Uh, not read goes into there. Um, and that gets stored with... D-O-R. So I'm not sure what that is. Um, anyway, it's a type of handshake. Now here's where it does get interesting. Um, I was not familiar with the 74LS670 chip. Uh, it turns out the 670 chip is like um, a programmable memory. It's four bits out, four bits in. So it's a four by four block of memory, four bits by four bits. And um, it's used as their page, um, page um, paging scheme. So they can write to this little 4x4 memory with this page write. Uh, and so they can reprogram this thing on the fly and set these memory address um, uh, signals by however this little uh, RAM chip is, is programmed. And there's two of them, so they um, have quite a bit of flexibility in, in programming all of the different addresses in this and paging them around. So uh, quite clever, these uh, 670 chips I've never seen before. So um, here's a latch, something's being latched, D0 is being latched. Uh, uh, looks like some some reset. Oh, I know what it is. It's a power. It's power on reset. So when there's a power on reset, you have to you have to page your memory correctly so you can boot up. So when you have the reset, uh, then uh, you can uh, enable certain pages and make sure that you uh, are pointed to the right place in ROM 
so the thing boots up the same way every time. Uh, then there are some other uh, 139s. These are 204 decoders. Um, again, just for uh, chip selecting um, some type of uh, addressing scheme. Um, the serial interface is TTL on the input and RS-232 voltages on the output. So this is a charge pump device that uh, gives you plus or minus, you know, 12 volts or something like that on the output. Maybe plus or minus 10, I think these things do. Anyway, it's just a little charge pump device. Um, calls out a MAX-202. I'm using an ST-232. Uh, I think a max 232 would work if you change the, the capacitor values. It, there's a lot of chips that 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 do this. Uh, it does have a power on reset circuit um, with this 10 microfarad capacitor, um, so it does generate a reset pulse on power up. There's also a switch um, that allows you to uh, reset it. Uh, there's two power connectors, a coaxial type, and then a little two pin job. The little two pin job is to bring, I think, five volts out to your disk drive. I think that was just added for convenience. Um, there are two LEDs, one for power and one for a halt uh, condition. Um, and there are three oscillators. Uh, the CPU runs at eight megahertz. Uh, these are canned oscillators, so they're not crystals. They're, they're actually also oscillator cans. Um, CPU runs at 8 megahertz. Uh, we said before the UART operates at uh, 1.8 megahertz and the floppy disk drive operates at 16 megahertz. Um, yeah, so I think that's all that's going on there. So like I said, uh, in about a week, I think I should have all the parts and we should be able to give this thing a try. Uh, I will shoot a video on how to get the ROM or actually the flash flash RAM in this thing um, programmed. Um, it's uh, I had some trouble and uh, you might have some trouble too. So I'll show you what I did to uh, get this thing to work. And uh, we'll get it uh, once I get that chip, uh, we'll program it, put it in the board.